Mike has two different um, passages for us to look at this morning before he begins his lesson. The first one is from 1 Samuel chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. That's 1 Samuel 20, 1 through 4. <clears throat> Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before your father that he is seeking my life? And he said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing either great or small without disclosing it to me. So why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Yet David vowed again, saying, your father knows well that I have found favor in your sight, and he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is hardly a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. And our second passage that we're going to look at today is in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. So flip over to the Gospel of John. And we're going to look at chapter 15 and verse 15. John 15, 15. Everybody there? No longer do I call you slaves. This is our Lord speaking. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the adult class. We are in uh, lesson number 18 of The Rise of David, and we have been chronicling this young man uh, in his rise from shepherd boy from the sheep pens of his father, Jesse, to facing and conquering the great armored giant, marrying into the family of Saul, and having a brilliant military career only to suddenly and abruptly see it like overnight change for him. In the prime of health, People have lost it. Uh, an executive on the rise, like uh, going up an ex escal escalator, uh, and then suddenly it stops. This past week, I had two such executives uh, from different forms of uh, uh, work in their careers come and meet with me and I showed them this very passage and the things that I said to them I will say to you this morning I had a very good friend who was driving down a major uh, intersection of Oklahoma City he is a brilliant attorney tax attorney state attorney, and his name is even on the marquee of this business firm. He was driving, and the next thing he knows, his car is pulled off on the side, and he's, his front end is all wrecked. He passed out without any warning whatsoever. Uh, he was brought in for a lot of tests, and they gave him a pacemaker. Welcome to David's world. You're, you think uh, everything's just going along, going along, as it normally does, and then it doesn't. The merry-go-round stops for whatever reason. And so David, now who was the toast of Jerusalem, is on the run. He didn't even have time to clean out his closet. He is running, and the government is after him. We've referenced that previously back in chapter 19 with the words fled and escaped. Fled and escaped, 
David is running, and he goes and runs to those who he trusts the most. He has gone to Samuel at Naoth, and now he is moving again. You see the word fled in chapter 20 and verse 1 to Jonathan. Here's our preposition from our last study. Uh, it's translated to or came. Uh, back in chapter 19, verse 24, you find it. And there it's probably translated in. The word is before. It is lipni, L-I-P-N-E. Uh, it is used for one being before a superior authority. The significance back in 19 was that Saul the king fell Lipni before the superior authority of the prophet Samuel. And that's where it was found in a profound way. Here, David is before the power and authority of his Saul's son, Jonathan. I call him Jonathan the Great, Jonathan the Magnificent. An absolutely fabulous human being who lived his life gallantly before the Lord. I want you to look at the three interrogatories that really frame this beginning and our lesson for us today. What? 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 I read these questions and they make me want to cry. I think because I remember back to my questions in my life. Why? Why? What? 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 Why? 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 The three questions match precisely the three attempts of Saul uh, from his hand. You remember the spears, random, unprovoked. Our inspired writer tells us that it's spiritual warfare, an, an evil spirit from God came upon Saul as judgment. Judgment to him and judgment for the nation because he affects the nation. And that evil spirit would spring upon the man. But David didn't know that. He had no idea. You and I are reading the history, the sacred history of what happened. But David is living it, not reading it. One of the great mistakes we make is we have a friend in a trial, a deep, dark crevice to his time and life, and we just flood him with verses. He probably knows the verses. What he wants is a friend. He wants somebody there with him, staying with him, close to him, checking in with him, because he's living in it, and you're not. Maybe it's cancer. Maybe it's a stroke that debilitates the man suddenly. But he is there, and he's suddenly in it, and you're not. And what he needs is just your presence. Just to be there. What? 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 Huh. I've read this uh, either from A.W. Tozer or A.T. Pearson. A.T. Pearson would be the earliest, so I probably favor him. But I've seen this quoted from both men. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. 
That's very profound. You know, I have seen in my 50 years, 51, 52 years of walking with Jesus Christ, I have seen young men, call them young, they're filled with passion, they're filled with zeal, but I've seen them make great fools out of themselves. They would tell you that they made the tough calls. They've made the hard decisions. And that they have uh, done it for righteousness' sake. And, and that in some way they see themselves as martyrs for the truth. I've seen that several times. And I always come away with the same mentality. They just haven't cried enough. What? 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 What is God doing? Well, David's living in it. You and I are studying the history. So we have an entirely different perspective. We see the story. We see the forest. He sees the tree. And you have no perspective. What is he doing? David, he is making a great king. And you cannot be a great king by just killing giants and being a military hero. You've got to suffer. Men carved David like Michelangelo out of marble. That's man carving man. But God carves David out of tears. Out of heartbreak. Not out of marble. He molds him out of disillusionment. And he shapes him in pain. That's why David's the greatest king that ever lived. This is the required course from the Lord God Almighty that lasts about 15 years. It will be intense for a while, and then it will ameliorate and get a little better and better and better. But make no mistake, you are at rock bottom here. And you're going to be at rock bottom all the way to Achish, in Gath, into the cave of Adullam, where he cries out he has no refuge, but the Lord is his refuge. It's been my personal experience that when I go through situations like this, that I really am kind of the last to know anything. Now, James says, James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Others outside myself can see things so clearly that's the value of a friend. It's a value of what David has here, Jonathan, his friend. And that's why he goes to him, a man he trusted the most. We haven't seen Jonathan since chapter 19 and verse 7. And uh, he has really caught off guard by this experience of David. He has no knowledge of these previous attempts upon David's life. The last thing he had heard about the matter between his father and David was Saul's own oath. 1 Samuel 19.6 
He shall not be put to death. So Jonathan, picking up from there, verse 2, says emphatically, you shall not die. Now that's a phrase that's important in 1 Samuel because it's used 11 times. And we should understand it as a prayer, as a godly desire. Believing his father's oath, he didn't consider David in any real danger. Interesting, both Jonathan and David are innocent in all their conduct and conversation. Jonathan believing his father's oath. He says, you know my father will not do anything great or small, without revealing it to me. That's the language of intimacy. We find it in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 18, verse 7. Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, said the Lord. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord will not do anything, but he reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. But here's the ugly reality. Men of the flesh do hide things. Men in the flesh have a secret life. Men in the flesh hide things from their wives and from members of their family. That's the ugly reality. The Apostle Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 11, if you would judge yourself, you will not be judged. My friends, if you have a secret life, confess it to the Lord. Not to me, to the Lord. Who will forgive you, for it is a sin. Now, what David is going to do here is he's going to attempt to explain the situation that Jonathan knows nothing about. Verse 3, your father must know that I have your favor, or I have found favor and have thought Jonathan should not know this matter, lest he be grieved. But indeed, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there's only a step between me and death. Wow, what a statement. You're being manipulated, Jonathan, and that is the behavior of wickedness. David says, your father must know. I have your favor. Now, you remember that word favor? We've discussed it often. We discussed it in the book of Proverbs. It comes from above. It is like a bucket of paint poured down upon you. It comes from God and it affects the mind, the heart, the disposition of a third party toward us, for example. Uh, the classic normative text for this would be a couple in the Old Testament, Ruth chapter 2, verse 13. She stumbles working into a field, not knowing the name of who owns the field. She's a for foreigner from Moabite. A Moabitess, and, uh, and suddenly the shadow of this man comes over her, and, uh, and he pronounces good blessings to her, kindness to her. And she asks the question, why have I found favor in your eyes? Well, the reason is because God worked upon his heart 
to provide that favor. We see it again in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 9. God caused the official to show favor to Daniel. So favor is what we would say, for some reason that person liked me. For some reason that person did kindness for me, and it defies explanation. I can remember back in the 60s, NBC used to have a documentary series called White Paper. And for the first time as a young man, I watched this docu-series about the Nazi atrocities. I had never really known much about it. And one point in particular in the story was this woman that said we were told to undress in this room and then we were led into this room of showers. Only water didn't come out. Gas came out. She said the door was sealed and closed, and as the gas poured out, women were screaming. And then suddenly, the door opened, and two Nazi soldiers walked in with gas masks, and they called for her name. She said, I was so weak I couldn't raise my hand, but we made eye contact, and they grabbed her by the arm and drug her out and closed the door. She said, to this day, this is back in the 60s, I do not know why they <clears throat> drug me out of that shower room. She said, I was Czechoslovakian, perhaps it had something to do with that. I do not know. And I guess we'll never know. That's called the favor of God, my friends. And it defies explanation. Look, there should be no human reason for Jonathan to show David favor. They should be a rival. But instead, he shows unusual kindness to him. Oh, that I might have the heart of Jonathan and be that kind of person. Showing favor to people because God has been favorable to me in grace and mercy. Now look at the word grieved. That, that stuck out to me because that's the beginning of our study from lesson one. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, 35, and Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, for Samuel grieved, that's our word, over Saul. 1 Samuel 16, 1, our beginning lesson. How long, said the Lord, will you grieve Samuel over Saul? There's our word. And now it's used here. Jonathan, if you knew the heart of your diabolical father, you would be grieved. This man saw like a, like a tattoo on the skin. This word grieved is associated with him in Samuel. He's the cause for grief. He was for Samuel the prophet, and now here he is with the potential of causing grief for the righteous Jonathan. Uh, that's a lesson for us. Wickedness, self-centeredness causes grief to your family, to your friends. 
in any form, in any context of relationships. Sin divides. Sin separates. Sin breaks apart. One of Dan Duncan's good friends and mine was a trial attorney in Oklahoma City who came from Kansas. He was a great trial attorney. He won cases. And he had a close friend, a husband and wife. And he told me the pain of getting a call from the wife that her husband had taken up with another woman and left the family. And she said, would you be so kind as to represent me? I know no place else to turn. He did that. And here's the way he described it. Never forget it. I sit in the court with this friend of mine to my left, the wife. And here was my friend to my right at another table on the other side. And he did not say one word to me. He never made eye contact with me. He just bowed his neck in harsh reality of self-centeredness and wickedness. I want a judgment for her, he said, and I never saw my former friend ever again. That's what sin does. It tears apart. It breaks asunder. Jonathan is going to transcend his father and his family relationship for his friend. And that's the lesson here. Jonathan lives to make a promise to one friend that he made earlier. Verse 4, the sincere pledge. And that is what opens the heart of his friend, David, to him, to confide in him, to speak with great gravity about his own inner emotions and what he's thinking. That's why you want to be there for your friends. Listen to them. Listen to them tell you their pain, their frustration. Don't give them verses. Listen. And you can say to them, I know exactly how you feel. And I'm here for you. That's a friend. Saul had tried to kill him. David had evaded him. Saul sent messengers to take him from his home. Jonathan knew nothing about it. Saul's next attempt was to send people to arrest him. His wife let him down out of a window, and he fled into the night. Saul came after him again, down at Naoth. But the Spirit of God protected him, put him into a trance. That's the word prophesied, and we dealt with it last lesson. What I find interesting in all that history is that David defines it with one word. See? Step. That's what he calls all that. Step. Well, it may have been a step for David. That may have been in his mind. But the reality is it was as far as God has created the width of the universe. I think of that bullet blazing the side of Donald Trump's face 
And we said, oh, it was only the turn of a head. Only the turn of a head. The slight turn of a head. But there was steel between that bullet and his head. Here's what we learn about the word step from the Old Testament. It really exposes to us the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God is what we all are here at Believer's Chapel for. For anyone that says, no, I'm here for worship. Really? How do you know how to worship? Well, I, I, I see the stained glass windows. I, I see the robes. I, I smell the incense. I, I see the candles. That's how I worship. No. How do you know how to worship? How do you know what you're doing? You need the knowledge of God. That's what changes people. You know nothing without the knowledge of God. So here is the word step. And interestingly, it exposes us in the Old Testament to the knowledge of God. Let me give that to you. That's Job 31.4. He has seen my ways and He's counted my steps. The knowledge of God. He's closer than your skin. David, writing Psalm 37, verse 23. He's writing as an older man, looking back upon his career and his life. The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Established, fixed, set in place. Psalm 11.2, like an arrow strung to the string of a bow. It's fixed. It's set in place. And David says that he knows everything about me. That's the way I th the knowledge of God informs David about his life and his steps. And here he's in anguish and he's thinking about a step, just next step, I'm going to die. No, David, you're not going to die. It looks like a tiny step for a man, but it is broad as the universe in God's sovereign protection over your life. He saw it as Saul breathing down his neck. But in reality, it's a steel wall that you cannot see. That's His love for you and His care over your life, my friends. Our lives are not about odds or luck or chance. Our lives are about God's sovereign purpose. That's why He brought you out of darkness into light. That's why He loved you before you even existed in the foundation of the world. He's got a plan and He's got a purpose. And it's a good one. And learning the Word of God will inform you as to what that purpose is. It will give you the skill for living that you need. Here's the will of God for you and me. Jim Elliott defined it in such a brisk way. Live your life, he said, in such a way that all you have to do is die. I don't I don't have, I've got things I've got to do when I get home. I've got to get my taxes finished up. I've got this, I've got that. But hey, if God takes me today, praise God. Takes me. Take me, Lord Jesus. He will give you everything you need in this life to accomplish His purpose and to make you the purpose person that He wants you to be. And the price tag of that is pain. Everybody wants the finished product. 
but the price tag is pain. And David is going through it. And we're going to walk it with him. So verse 4, Jonathan says to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. That's kind of backwards, isn't it? Uh, it goes this way. I make all these promises and pledges, but when the crunch comes, I'm gone. That was the Apostle Paul's experience, wasn't it? 2 Timothy 4.16, he was deserted by all his loyalists at his first defense before a Roman tribunal. Oh, I'll be there, said Peter. You can count on me. Thick and thin, you can count on me. Well, Jonathan, what an exceptional fellow. He is going to live up to his promises and pledges. Charles Bridges said something that I think is true to form for life. Expect nothing from the world and everything from the Lord. If God puts in your life a friend or friends who will always be loyal to you, who will pray for you, be concerned and care for you, be interested in you, my friends, you have something that the world can't buy. You have something very amazing given to you. David began in verse 1 with what? And his true covenant friend answered, whatever. What is a pronoun seeking specific information? Whatever is a pronoun declaring Anything. Anything. What are you? And to whom are you? If there should ever be friends and showing favor, it should be with one another right here. We're all the products of grace and God's favor. We should be overflowing in kindness and graciousness to one another at all times. Now let me close with what Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 15. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. All right, let's analyze that verse. I want you to observe Servants is mentioned twice. To know or to have made known is mentioned twice. For, or the New American Standard translates it because, so it's a purpose <coughs> clause right at the beginning of the end of the verse. That for or because is so important to what our Lord is teaching. And the means of all of that, from servants to friends, is the knowledge of God. Look at the repetition of the word call. I no longer call, but now I do call. The 
Word of God is the transforming agent to the servant to make him a friend. You see that? The knowledge of God is the call. So here is what Jesus is saying. Learn the Word of God so that you can turn around to others and minister to them. Don't look at them as servants. Look at them as family members, friends, and treat them that way. We are a transformed people. We're different than the world. And we cannot be defined or explained by the world. They do it now politically. These people are this and they're that. They don't know. They look at us from the outside. But they don't know us. My friends, this Word is transformative. And you know who needs to be transformed the most? Me. Me. Revival starts in the church of God. It needs to start here. Not there. Here. And may God in His grace change me to look at you as I would my own family. Because we're all in this together. The favor of God has fallen upon us like a bucket of paint. And we have been brought like that dear Czechoslovakian woman from showers of death to release to life. That's what Jonathan is pledging to David. And that should be our pledge to one another. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word to us this morning. Thank You for Your kindness, generosity, and grace to surround us with people of kindness and caring that transforms us and frankly puts us to shame that we might be your friend, Lord, because you have been ours from the very beginning. Now may the grace and mercy of God through His Word transform us by His power. Amen.